Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. We're back with another look at the history news headlines to mark the first Friday of the month. This time we're looking at the headlines that caught my eye in April 2022. As always, I'll be using the description box to link the history news articles we'll be looking at today in addition to any other relevant materials. We have some updates, new news and our new segment that looks at upcoming and recently opened events and exhibitions. Also, if you want to refresh your memory on any of the previous History News Roundup videos, then you can check out the linked playlists. They are divided by year, so we have 2021 and 2022. Before we look at those History News headlines, I want to say a huge thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is an online learning platform that hosts thousands of classes from people willing to share their skills so you can develop yours. I'm really keen to find ways to ensure that the content on this channel is as good as possible and getting better all the time. Skillshare offers so many classes on film and video creation that I couldn't wait to join. Whatever you're looking to learn, there are so many classes to choose from, you are sure to find something to take your fancy. I would really like to film some videos on location, but I need some guidance on how I might be able to go about doing this effectively. So I decided to take Caleb Babcock and Niles Gray's class on iPhone filmmaking, create cinematic video with your phone. I found the third lesson on gear and apps really useful, especially the part about using gimbals, tripods and mics with the iPhone. I'm looking forward to doing a new gadget shopping spree and experimenting with what I've learned on Skillshare. Skillshare is a creative and inspiring community. Skillshare is the place to keep you learning. With a Skillshare membership, you can access their ever-growing list of premium classes to explore whenever suits you. Skillshare is also ad-free, so you can stay in the zone while you're exploring new skills. The first 1,000 people to use the link in my description box or my code will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. And now, without further ado, let's jump right into the history news from April 2022. Last month's History News video went live on April Fool's Day and I mentioned that I would share any history pranks that caught my eye with you in this video. In the very tricksy and nearly believable category was the announcement from Shakespeare's Globe that the team there had taken up mudlarking as a group hobby and that this had now paid off through the discovery of Shakespeare's family ring on the foreshore of the Thames. Special mention goes to the Yorkshire Museum, who tweeted about a new acquisition they were excited to display. This historic Yorkshire pudding. But the one that won the day for me was the collaboration between the teams at Leeds Castle, Knight Edmunds Estate Agents and Right Move to spin a yarn about Leeds Castle going up for sale with an asking price of £125 million. What sets this prank apart for me is the dedication. I mean, they even produced a promo video talking about an ideal buyer, in which they also throw some shade at Boris Johnson. Did you see an April Fool's that beats this one? Let us know in the comments section. Now it's time to look at the updates. Thanks go to Melanie King on Twitter for sending me a link to this New Yorker article on the forgotten movement to reclaim Africa's stolen art. This is both an update and also a precursor in terms of context for our frequent looks at the Benin Bronzes. This article has also given me a new book that I want to buy. Benedict Savoy's book, Africa's Struggle for Its Art, History of a Post-Colonial Defeat, because it looks absolutely fascinating. The New Yorker article offers the following quote from the book. Nearly every conversation today about the restitution of cultural properties in Africa already happened 40 years ago. In October 1973, when Mobutu Sese Seko, the president of Zaire, 
denounced the, quote, barbarous systematic pillaging of Africa's cultural patrimony on the world stage while speaking on the floor of the United Nations. In the following December, we are told, Baroness Lee of Ashridge told the House of Lords, quote, when it comes to returning booty from this country, we should tread warily. It may turn into a striptease. In 1978, the UN was once again the stage for the restitution debate when the Director General of UNESCO from the time, Amadou Mata Mbao, issued a moving appeal on behalf of the world's culturally plundered peoples. Quote, Everything which has been taken away, from monuments to handicrafts, were more than decorations, he said. They bore witness to a history, the history of a culture and of a nation whose spirit they perpetuated and renewed. However, Julian Lucas, author of this article, highlights that the damage may already have been done to the restitution argument. He writes that, quote, Baroness Lee's racy analogy flipped the script of colonial victimhood. Now, it was Britannia, stripped of her empire, who would be forced to give up the booty. Such warnings spread throughout the 70s as museums mobilised to defend the integrity of their collections. If you loan a Benin bronze to Nigeria, the argument ran, they'll probably ask to keep it. And if you let them keep it, soon they'll ask for the whole collection. By the time it's all over, Germany will have to send Nefertiti back to Egypt. By 1978, the European press was souring on restitution, mocking Mbao's measured speech at the UN with cartoons of carts emptying the Louvre. That year, a group of German museum directors and cultural officials gathered in Bonn, where they drafted a confidential memo that Savoy describes as the matrix of all blockades against restitution. The document argued that Western countries had no legal or moral duty to repatriate artworks that were now owned by humanity as a whole. It suggested changing the word restitution to transfer, imposing onerous conservation requirements on claimants and refraining from the publication of catalogues that might encourage covetousness. Above all, the group insisted that history didn't matter. The way in which objects arrived in the collections of Europe and North America, they wrote, was of no consequence. It certainly appears that this book will provide vital context for understanding the arguable stalemate that we have reached with some institutions, the British Museum in particular, when it comes to discussing and enacting repatriation. I certainly look forward to reading it. Melanie also sent me a link to this article that discusses a film. Restitution, Africa's Fight for Its Art, which is available to stream through PBS. Being in the UK, unfortunately, I don't have access to watch this video, but I think you're able to stream it if you're in the US and perhaps elsewhere. We are told that it tells the story of the original colonial theft of African artworks and artefacts, while also discussing the contemporary demand for the return of these artefacts to their rightful countries of origin. If you get to watch it, do let me know what you think. We also have this article, which provides greater context for the story discussed in the last History News video, regarding a potential upcoming legal challenge that may be issued due to the British Museum's refusal to permit the Institute for Digital Archaeology to 3D scan the Parthenon marbles. When I was discussing this story last month, I pointed out that it seemed that some scans had been taken of the marbles without the museum's permission. Now, this interpretation by me was queried in my comments section, and I could certainly see why. I had thought a different organisation had taken the scans, but this new article asserts that the Institute of Digital Archaeology, the IDA, took their own. That's either in addition to or instead of the set that were taken by another group. Cassie Packard, writing for Hyperallergic, states that, quote, Although permission had been denied, a team from the IDA brought an iPad-sized scanner to the British Museum and began to make scans. The museum said in a statement at the time that it was deeply concerned to hear suggestions that unauthorised scanning 
took place in our galleries, declaring the move a breach of our visitor regulations. In response, the IDA's executive director, Roger Michael, countered that they, quote, fully adhered to the museum visitor guidelines, which seem to have been drafted to accommodate 3D scans. The British Museum spokesperson explained that the British Museum has used 3D scanning on objects in the past and that in 2013 and 2017 had even allowed a team from the Acropolis Museum in Athens to scan the Parthenon marbles. But Roger Michael rebuffed this and pointed out that 2013, quote, was the Stone Age for 3D scanning. Better scan technology probably means better replicas. So is this perhaps the real cause of the British Museum's refusal to allow these new scans? Either way, we'll have to wait to see what any outcome of any legal challenge that may be launched in this regard will be. But rest assured, if and or when there's an update, I will be sure to let you know. Who remembers the story of the perfectly preserved dinosaur egg that was discovered in China? The dinosaur inside was thought to be on the verge of hatching and was given the name baby Yingliang. Researchers have expressed how special this find is due to the level of preservation of this fossil. This level of preservation allowed them to more clearly see the posture that this embryo had adopted, which they found was similar to the one that's adopted by modern birds just before they hatch. Professor Steve Brusate, part of the research team from the University of Edinburgh, is quoted as saying, this dinosaur embryo inside its egg is one of the most beautiful fossils I have ever seen. This little prenatal dinosaur looks just like a baby bird curled in its egg, which is yet more evidence that many features characteristic of today's birds first evolved in their dinosaur ancestors. Those were the updates. Now it's time to look at the new news. At the start of last month, NPR reported that 53 cultural sites in Ukraine have been damaged since the Russian invasion. Presumably, as the conflict continues, this number will sadly increase. Indeed, at the time of making this video, according to UNESCO's website, it is now being reported that 100 Ukrainian heritage sites have been damaged. Deepa Shivaram reports that, quote, When the war began, UNESCO implemented some emergency measures in order to best protect these cultural sites. It held regular online meetings with World Heritage Site managers, museum directors, national monument officials and local heritage protection associations in Ukraine to provide expertise and practical advice. UNESCO says it has experts available 24-7 to respond to emergencies. If cultural sites are marked with a blue shield, the convention's emblem it means they are under the protection of the Convention. If attacks are committed against these sites, UNESCO says, the perpetrators will be held responsible for acts constituting war crimes. I will be on the lookout for any further information as it comes in. Additionally, anyone who has the ability to translate into Ukrainian. I will be leaving a link to this page. This team are looking for volunteers to translate and proofread at least 100 early age digital books into Ukrainian in order to ensure the learning continuity for out of school children from Ukraine. If you do happen to have the requisite skills to do this, please consider volunteering. In November 2000, an internal request from within Cambridge University Library sought to remove two notepads belonging to Charles Darwin from the library's special collection strong room to be photographed. A couple of months later, it was found that these notebooks could not be located. At first, it was thought they had been returned to the wrong place. Searches were conducted at various points, to no avail. By 2020, the university's librarian, Dr Jessica Gardner, concluded they had probably been stolen. She called in the police and informed Interpol. Also, a public campaign was launched in the hopes of bringing about their safe return. But on the 9th of March 2022, a bright pink gift bag was left outside Dr Gardner's office in a CCTV blind spot. In the bag was the original blue box the notebooks were kept in and 
a plain brown envelope. The envelope had a printed message. Librarian, Happy Easter, Kiss. The envelope contained the two missing notebooks, wrapped tightly in cling film. Police are still investigating the theft and now the return of these items, but despite the intervening 22 years, the notebooks are apparently, quote, in remarkably good condition, and every page that should be there is there. If the thief or thieves and or the returner of these notebooks is ever identified, I will be sure to update you all. A drawing by Michelangelo which was discovered and identified in 2019, is set to be auctioned by Christie's this month on the 18th of May. The auction house estimates that this piece might fetch 30 million euros or $33 million, which is around 25 and a half million pounds. Until recently, this piece had been designated a French national treasure, which prevented it from being exported but the French government have recently removed that designation, which allows the drawing to now be offered to collectors anywhere in the world. In the lead-up to this auction, the drawing is set to be exhibited in Hong Kong and New York. The auction will then take place in Paris. But there are a few more auctions that also made the news last month. On the 9th of June, a collection of 50 old masters are scheduled to be auctioned by Christie's in New York. Known as the Alana Collection, due to it being amassed over decades by Chilean billionaire Alvaro Sayer and his wife Anna Guzman. Their collection draws its title from the combination of their first names. The collection is currently thought to be worth between 30 and 50 million dollars, which is around 23.5 to 39 million pounds. The collection is going to be made available for viewing alongside Christie's 20th and 21st century art in London, Hong Kong, Los Angeles and New York prior to the auction. This 1932 portrait by Pablo Picasso, which depicts his muse and lover Marie-Thérèse Walter as a multi-limb sea creature, is set to be auctioned through Sotheby's in May. It is expected to fetch more than $60 million, which is around £47 million. There is another 20th century work being auctioned this month too. Jackson Pollock's Number 31 from 1949 will be sold by Christie's in New York on the 12th of May, where it is expected to fetch more than $45 million, which is around £35 million. Prior to the auction, this piece has been made available to view at Christie's in Los Angeles. A 15-page manuscript, dated December 1829, measuring 3.8 by 2.5 inches or 9.6 by 6.3 centimetres and containing 10 poems by a 13-year-old Charlotte Bronte has just sold for $1.25 million, which is nearly a million pounds. The manuscript is stitched in its original brown paper covers and is entitled A Book of Rhymes by Charlotte Bronte, sold by nobody and printed by herself. The buyers, who have described the item as, quote, inch for inch, possibly the most valuable literary manuscript ever to be sold, are a British literary charity called Friends of the National Libraries. They will be donating their purchase to the Bronte Parsonage Museum in Harworth, Yorkshire. Hopefully, it will be able to go on display there at some point soon, and I will update if there are any announcements in relation to this. The next headlines we're going to look at were shared with me on Twitter, so I will be offering my thanks to the people who let me know about these articles. Thanks go to Jane for sending me the following collection of headlines. First up, we have the discovery and investigation of the industrial-sized sandstone quarry sites that have been found in the heart of Mitharka country in Queensland's Channel country and are thought to date back at least 2,100 years. While work is still being done to understand the site, researchers do know that these quarry sites were part of a well-developed system of trading grindstones, silcrete tools, seeds and more. 
The Mataka People's Cultural Landscape, on which this site was found, has been shortlisted for assessment for National Heritage Listing, which the community hopes will eventually lead to World Heritage status to protect this site for generations to come. In particular, it is hoped that these protections might offset any threats to the integrity of the landscape that may be posed by the Queensland government's recent granting of gas exploration leases in Channel Country. Some of the archaeological finds that have been made on this site are now part of an exhibition that is titled Kilenderi, meaning the heart of Channel Country, and it's set to run until the 7th of August 2022. Jane also sent me this article, which recounts how advances in dating methods have led to a reassessment of the Yira Rock Shelter in eastern Pilbara, Western Australia. It is now believed that it is significantly older than once thought, and that it dates back more than 50,000 years. Previous studies using radiocarbon dating had managed to date the site back to 23,000 years old, so these new techniques have provided quite the extension to that date range. The site is sacred to the Yinawonka people, and this reassessment also proves that this Aboriginal community have lived in this region for much longer than was previously thought too. Archaeos Excavation Project Manager and Director Fiona Hook explains that this reinterpretation is, quote, now revolutionising our evidence for the first people arriving in Australia and also pushing back sites into a much older regime. This site is now older than 50,000 years old. We'll be able to, in the next few months, determine how much older than 50 the site is. Aboriginal people used this site repeatedly during the height of the last ice age. There are no other sites around in the Pilbara that have this degree of evidence. If and or when any further information about dating for this site comes up, I will be sure to update you all. Jane also sent me this article about the discovery of a number of post-Roman and pre-Norman royal burials in modern-day Western England and Wales. There has now been an analysis of 20 probable Celtic royal burial sites, each of which housed up to five graves and appear to date from between the 5th to 6th centuries CE. These recently found sites are also said to show a number of similarities with Ferta, or graves, that are commonly found in Ireland. Professor Ken Dark highlights the significance of these finds, explaining that, quote, This is a period of history that we know very little about. In fact, it's possibly a period of history we know the least about. Before this, there were only two possible burial sites of Celtic British rulers from this period that we knew of, but now there may be over 20. I look forward to seeing what new things these discoveries will come to teach us about this population and period in British history. The final article that was sent to me by Jane is this one, which also kind of feels at the start of a horror movie. Beneath a building which is being transformed into a centre that is intended to house 550 children for PGL Children's Activity Holidays, so in essence, this is beneath a summer camp, basically, it has been discovered that there sits a burial site. Human remains were spotted by builders on the 14th of April, and unsurprisingly, this led to all the work on the site being stopped. John Buglas, an archaeologist who has previously studied the area, is quoted as saying, it looks like it had a prehistoric landscape. That suggests, in my experience of dealing with prehistoric sites, that somewhere near where the remains have been found will be the remains of a roundhouse where somebody had an Iron Age farm. In the Iron Age, typically, they didn't have big organised cemeteries. It was a very scattered dispersal and population. When Uncle Fred died, you just buried him out the back. If it is a prehistoric burial, that suggests there was some form of settlement very nearby, within a few hundred metres. It also pushes the history of Newby Whisk back a thousand years, as the first records of the village are doomsday. What else lies beneath? That's the question. If and or when building work is allowed to resume, and the PGL Holiday Centre can be finished, 
I can only imagine the ghost stories are going to get told in those dorms. I would bet money that parents up and down the country are going to find themselves wondering why their kids won't sleep properly for about a month after they've come back from being away there. I want to thank Melissa Frank for letting me know about the metal detectorist that found a ring that once belonged to the Sheriff of Nottingham, albeit it was one that was in post quite a while after the one that was played by Alan Rickman, among others. But for me, Alan Rickman is my favourite. This ring once belonged to Sir Matthew Jennison, who was the Sheriff of Nottingham between 1683 and 1684. The arms on the ring are those of the Jennison family. The ring was one of the lots to be auctioned on the 24th of March at Hanson's Auction House in Derbyshire. It sold for £8,500, which is $11,115, and it went to a, to my knowledge, unidentified phone bidder. I do find myself wondering if they are planning to wear the ring, though. Thanks also go to Lemma Smith for sending a link to this article my way. It's on the repatriation by Dartmouth College of the papers of Samson Ockham to the Mohegan tribe to which this Presbyterian minister, scholar and educator belonged. Dartmouth College, which uses the papers in its teaching, has created digitised copies and transcriptions of the materials that were repatriated on the 27th of April. The papers include letters, journals, a Hebrew primer and a herbal, a handwritten record of the medicinal uses of various plants. College archivist Peter Carini states that, quote, it's an incredible group of materials and they're going to their rightful home. The place where they'll be within the context of the land and the people whom Ockham was championing. And that's really good. This article is another link that was sent to me by Melanie King, who also kindly sent those links to articles that I referred to in the update section of this video. A recently published study shared the result of an analysis of ceramic pots from 11th to 12th century Jerusalem. The chemical tests on a collection of these spheroconical vessels show that they served a variety of purposes. Three most probably contained oils, scented materials and medicines, while a fourth vessel, a thick-walled, undecorated stoneware pot, contained sulphur, mercury and magnesium. According to the researchers, these ingredients point to this vessel having once contained, quote, a locally invented explosive material. Further to this, the size and shape of one of these recovered vessels suggests that it was used as a grenade. More research is set to take place, which will enhance our understanding of explosive weaponry and its deployment. Thanks to Maria Karosha for this link to an article about an investigation of a cache of 19 cannons that were brought out of the Savannah River. Originally, it was thought that they had come from a sunken Confederate gunship. However, as AP News reports, experts for the US Navy found they didn't match any known cannon used in the Civil War. Further research indicates they're likely almost a century older and sank during the build-up to the Revolutionary War's bloody siege of Savannah in 1779. Now, officials with the US and British governments, as well as the state of Georgia, are working together on an agreement to preserve the newly found guns before putting them on display. The cannons are thought to have ended up in the river because the British scuttled six of their ships when they spotted French ships off the Georgia coast. These French ships were supporting the colonists against the British. According to reports, the aim is to display the cannons at the Savannah History Museum, where they can be housed in an institution that also incorporates the battlefield where the bloodiest fighting occurred during the 1779 siege. Now we're moving on to look at any events and exhibitions that I spotted last month. A new exhibition is due to open later this month on the 19th of May at the British Museum. According to the website, this exhibition, Feminine Power, the Divine to the Demonic, seeks to offer, quote, a cross-cultural look 
at the profound influence of female spiritual beings within global religion and faith. Bringing together sculptures, sacred objects and artworks from the ancient world to today, and from six continents, the exhibition highlights the many faces of feminine power. Ferocious, beautiful, creative or hell-bent and its seismic influence throughout time. This exhibition is scheduled to run until the 25th of September 2022, but on the 8th of May, so two days after this video is set to go live, so it will be quite a tight turnaround, there is set to be a connected performance event delivered by the storyteller Jan Blake. This event is called The Origins of Life and Death. Tickets for the performance and the exhibition can all be booked through the website, which I will be linking in my description box. Also opening later this month, but this time on the 21st of May and at the Walker Art Gallery in Liverpool, is an exhibition entitled The Tudors, Passion, Power and Politics, and it will run until the 29th of August 2022. Portraits of the Tudor monarchs will be exhibited alongside those of other famous and infamous individuals from the period. Exhibition highlights include the Westminster Tournament Roll. Produced in 1511, the roll celebrates the birth of Henry VIII's son with Catherine of Aragon. Also called Henry, he sadly died in infancy. The roll also features two images of John Blank a trumpeter of African descent who worked for both Henry VII and Henry VIII. We also learn that the Bacton Autocloth has been loaned to the gallery, as has the Bristow hat. Additionally, we are told that the Armada maps will also be displayed. This looks like it's going to be a really special exhibition. So much so, I am already scheming a scheme for us to find a way to take a family trip up to Liverpool. For those planning to be in or around Bilbao at some point before the 18th of September 2022, this exhibition at the Guggenheim Bilbao looks gorgeous. British architect Norman Foster has curated Motion, Autos Art Architecture. This exhibition contains, among other pieces, nearly 40 automobiles which have been selected for display because they are perceived to represent the, quote, best of its kind in such terms as beauty, rarity, technical progress and a vision of the future. The pictures of the exhibits I have seen look phenomenal. However, none of them showed me a Citroen 2CV, which is my favourite car of all time and, to my mind, one of the best pieces of machinery ever created. So perhaps one is included in the exhibition and just wasn't shown in the images that I saw, for some reason best known to themselves. So if anyone has been or ends up going to this exhibition, could you let me know if they do have a 2CV? And alternatively, you can also let me know which car you liked best in the exhibition. Last, but by no means least, is news of a $20 million Degas sculpture going on tour. The Little Dancer of 14 Years is currently on display at Christie's Auction House in San Francisco, but it is set to be transported to Hong Kong to be shown there next. Interestingly, it is going to be transported via the cloud, because what is on display is a 3D hologram in a special display case that was made by a company called Proto. According to the artnewspaper.com, quote, the tiny dancer rotates slowly in her futuristic display case and viewers can pause the rotation by tapping on the screen to examine the detail in the work. The physical sculpture once stood in the entranceway of the New York City apartment of Anne Bass. Now, the piece is set to be auctioned this month. It is estimated that it will achieve between $20 million and $30 million, or between $16 million and £24 million. Pounds. I'll be sure to let you know what it actually ends up going for. But in the meantime, what would you think of an exhibition that features some or even all holograms in cases like this, with touchscreens like this? 
would you pay money to see that sort of exhibition? Because I'm inclined to think that I probably would. But what do you think of any or all of the headlines we've looked at today? Were there any headlines that caught your eye in April that I didn't discuss in this video? What about any exhibitions and events that you might have spotted? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comments section underneath this video, or you can find me elsewhere on other social media. I will leave links to the other place you can find me on the internet in my description box, so do follow me over on some or all of them so we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, why not share it with your friends? Please also let me know you liked it by hitting the thumbs up. Please do subscribe to the channel, and I say it almost every week. If you think you are subscribed, please just have a little check right now. It's a great time to do it, just to make sure that YouTube hasn't mysteriously unsubscribed you. And while you're there, as you are now, I'm sure, just checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, why not also hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down menu that will pop up so that YouTube will tell you when I've next uploaded. I do hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.